It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. It is is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul when So trust in me. The Bible says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And Jesus said, Trust also in me. Jesus continues. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Do I give to you? So let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. It is 
Yes, Lord, indeed. Because of what you did on that cross, nothing can separate us from your love. Absolutely nothing, oh Lord. Lord, we are so grateful. And oh Lord, we just want to sing about how good you are, oh Lord. You are such a good God. We thank you for that, Father. We want to say thank you. And we want to sing to you how good you are. Filled with 
your power for the glory of Jesus name God you're so good God you're so good oh yes Lord God you're so good you're so so good God you're so good God you're so good you're so good to me you know church someday we'll come to that day But we always remember Calvary. We always remember the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Let's sing this. And should this life bring suffering Lord, I will remember Calvary. What Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. One more time, church. And should this life bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. Let us pray together. Father, we want to thank you because you are a good God. Your purposes for us is good. You have chosen us, you have healed us, you have given us salvation. And because of that, we want to praise you and we want to give you the highest praise. And we want to worship you from our hearts, from with our soul and with our minds and with all our strength. And Lord, we pray that this will uh, be, this worship will rise up as a sweet smelling sacrifice and you will receive it with a smile uh, on your face and Lord we pray that you be with us even as we continue to worship you in Jesus name we pray Amen please be seated and uh, we want to now prepare our hearts to give the Lord our tithes and our offerings as an act of worship if you are giving digitally open your bank app and uh, we have the uh, QR code uh, put up for you scan the QR code key in the amount and then uh, send it uh, to, to the Lord and uh, don't treat this as just a transaction, but uh, this is an act of worship. We want to give faithfully to the Lord, no matter how much or how little the Lord has blessed us, we want to worship Him and uh, maintain a heart of post uh, posture of uh, worship, even as you do so. If you are giving physical cash, we want you to go and get a big red packet, as big as possible, and uh, put the money into the red packet, and the next time, you, we, we come together in the sanctuary, you bring the red packet along with you for worship and then you can give physically to the Lord. And if you are writing a check, write the check out to us and uh, we will bank the check uh, uh, in for, for you on your behalf. God bless you, the cheerful giver.
Dear QBC family, we are into our second week of the circuit breaker. I trust that you're holding up well. I continue to spend an hour on every Thursday with my wife, praying for you and the church. If you want to be on this weekly prayer broadcast, send me a WhatsApp message at 97486372 and let me know who you are. We've just completed the season of Lent with the celebration of Easter last Sunday. And this week, we're going to start a new four-week series on theology. It's based upon the first four chapters of Genesis. The book of Genesis provides the foundational understanding of who we are as human beings created in the image of God. And then in our DGs, we'll discuss how we can apply this theology into modern-day issues like abortion, the definition of marriage, the reliability of scripture, and being my brother's keeper. On this note, I'm pleased to share with you that QBC has just been approved to be used as a shelter for those without a place to stay during this circuit breaker period. We have been praying that God would give us an opportunity to serve the community and those in need during this time. And praise the Lord, He opened this door for us that we can use the fellowship hall on level 1 to house about 15 to 20 people during this time. And so today I'd like to leave you with this verse from Genesis 4 verses 9 to 5 or 9 to 10. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You know, the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 24, says that we come to Jesus, who is the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. While Abel's blood cries out for vengeance, the blood of the greater Abel, Jesus Christ, cries out for forgiveness. And because the blood of Jesus speaks better than the blood of Abel, we have to ask ourselves, how can I be my brother's keeper during this circuit breaker period? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. Let us all rise and let us give thanks to the Lord for the offering and the tithes. Let us pray together. Father, we want to thank you that you are the giver of all good gifts and we have received much from you. And we thank you for this opportunity to bring a small portion to you as our act of worship. And Lord, we want to pray that you multiply these gifts and you give the leadership, the wisdom to use this money for the extension of your kingdom. And Lord, we pray that you continue to bless us, the cheerful giver, with more and more so we can worship you by giving you more and more. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Once again, a very warm welcome to uh, one and all, old, young, and uh, everybody in between. We want to thank God that we can worship together as a church. Uh, although dispersed in our homes, we can still worship the Lord together as one church. So we want to thank God for that. I have two announcements for you. The first one is about uh, discipleship groups, DG in short. Uh, DG, uh, we want to... Uh, encourage those of you who are in DG to continue to gather uh, virtually and uh, love one another, care for one another, share with one another and uh, pray with one another. Those of us who are not in DG, uh, the QR code is on the screen. We want you to uh, encourage you to uh, sign up for DG because we want you to be connected to the church. Yes, although this time, during this time, we are not able to gather together physically. We want to connect with one another virtually and uh, we can still continue uh, to pray for one another and share with one another. Uh, second announcement, we have been praying as a church uh, regarding reaching out to the community. And we are so thankful to God that this past week, uh, the authorities have uh, published in the newspaper that they 
want to encourage religious organizations and who have buildings to open up our buildings to house the homeless. So uh, QBC have responded and uh, we will be uh, partnering with the Transit Point at Margaret Drive uh, to take in some of these hard sleepers uh, who are homeless. And uh, we thank God for this wonderful opportunity and uh, we, want to, we want to encourage you to also come alongside with us. How can you come alongside with us? I think first of all, uh, you can uh, pray together with us. Secondly, uh, most of us have received the solidarity package from the government, $600. And uh, some of us are thinking about how we can uh, meaningfully uh, use this money. Perhaps you are in need, you can use it for yourself. But for some of us, we, we would like to donate the money. And uh, we want to uh, open up this avenue for you to uh, participate by giving part, uh, maybe 10%, 20%, maybe 100%, maybe 200%. As, as much as the Lord has stirred your heart to uh, partner us uh, in providing a shelter uh, for the heart steepers. And uh, the church already has uh, put up a temporary uh, sleeping area on the ground floor fellowship hall uh, to house them. So once we have received formal approval uh, from the authorities, we will take in the heart steepers. So we would need uh, a lot of prayer support we will need logistical support. We will also uh, need financial support. How do you give financially? It's the same way as you give uh, the offering uh, just now. Scan the QR code and uh, give to uh, give give by virtual means, or you can put it into the red packet and uh, bring it together uh, as a as an offering the next time uh, we come together. Or you can write a check and uh, give uh, towards this cause. We thank God for this opportunity even as we have been praying uh, God has opened the door that we cannot shut so let us give thanks to the Lord and also pray for Pastor Isaac before he preaches to us let us pray Father we want to thank you that uh, you have blessed us with much and we are reminded to be a blessing to others so Lord we thank you for the opportunity to be a blessing to the homeless and Lord we pray that as we come alongside them uh, they won't just find a shelter a physical shelter uh, in QBC, but more importantly, they find a spiritual shelter in the Lord. And Lord, Lord we pray uh, that uh, through our acts of love, some of them may even come to know you as their personal Savior and Lord. So Lord, have mercy on every soul that walks into QBC. And we pray also for Pastor Isaac now, even as he's going to preach the word, Lord, we pray that you fill him with your Holy Spirit, anoint your servant. And uh, Lord, we pray that as the Spirit stir our hearts, and uh, we will also align our hearts to yours and uh, uh, respond in an appropriate way. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Isaac, please. Good morning. Praise the Lord for another Sunday we get to worship Him. Especially want to welcome the kids uh, who are sitting at home with fam family. Now over the next few weeks, we are going to start a new series titled Theology and Life. What's the connection? Well, our theme for this year is on discipleship. And hence, being a follower of Christ, theology is important. And you may ask, Theo, what? Theology, that's the study of God. You see, how is it practical? When we know God, it forms our world view. And so it impacts every decision that we make. And so over the next four weeks, from the first four chapters of Genesis, we will study a few topics of theology and how it connects to some issue of our modern day life and then how we apply it to our lives. So let us go to a lot in the word of prayer before we begin. Let's pray. Father, we just want to commit this time to you. I thank you that we can worship wherever we are and your word is always pragmatic and practical and relevant. And so today as we open your word and preach your word, may the Holy Spirit Teach us, Lord, speak to us, and may Christ be lifted up. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Vanessa was a PhD student, and she had just applied for a grant to study in Harvard. And she discovered that she was pregnant. She was overjoyed, but she had a little problem. You see, she wasn't even in an official relationship with the father of a child. 
He said, let's get an abortion. I don't want this child. But I promise you that I will leave my current girlfriend and marry you. And later down the road, we can have our own children. Alice was 22 weeks pregnant when she discovered that her child had spina bifida, which is a serious developmental problem. And so the doctor asked her, do you want to keep this child? Now as for Kelly, she was doing her 12-week scan when she realised that her child had an underdeveloped scar and its chance for a long-term survival was almost zero. And the pregnancy was threatening her life. So her husband said, at the time it was a matter of a choice between the health of my wife and the survival of my child. Now friends, if you were in such situations, how would you choose? I mean, how do you even begin to decide? Let's look at this in a different light. Now if your teenage daughter were to come home, and tell you that she's pregnant. And it's not an April Fool's joke. She has a bright future ahead of her. How would you advise her? To get an abortion or not? And so this is a subject or topic that I would like to explore today. Between life or choice. We study the theology of the Imago Dei and then deal with this issue of abortion, and then finally how it applies to our lives. So let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. And the theology we're dealing with is the imago dei, that man is made in the image of God. This is Latin, imago means image, dei means of God. Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, why did the Bible begin like that? It doesn't even tell you, right, about God. It just presupposes God. It's just like an author, you know. The author doesn't explain his background. He just goes into the story. And so the Bible begins by, in the beginning, there's God. Now why? We must remember the intended audience at the time were the Israelites. And they were just leaving Egypt after 430 years of being slaves. And now in the wilderness... God was reconstituting them into a nation to bring them into the new land with new laws. And God wanted to know what the people to know, whom they were following. And so it is this God who created everything. And so when you take away you know, all the activities in Christianity, what do you have left? Now we don't really have to imagine much because right now we are in that situation, right? If take away everything around our faith, what is left, what is most important is who God is and who we are in relation to Him and hence why we worship Him. And so, friends, you know the Bible is not a book about us only. It is a book about God and how He unfolds His redemptive drama through history and tells us of this God who created everything. And God's creation is wonderful. Day one, day two, day three, he says, let there be light, let there be heavens and water, and then let there be land. And then in day four, notice, let there be a sun and moon, creatures, and then men. Let's take a look at this. That first day one, God created light, and day four, you know, light was sun and moon. So the first light was probably some stars or something. Day two, there's heavens and water, but they are void and empty. So in day five, God fills them. Day three, there's land and it's empty. And day six, God fills that land. So you see, God is the God who redeems cosmos out of chaos, who brings light out of darkness, His people out of captivity, and the world out of sin. And if you notice this pattern in Genesis 1, God creates something and then subsequently He fills it there's something different on day six when he made men. He says, let us make men in our image. So it's arguable that the climax for Genesis 1 is right here. Begins with God was there at the beginning 
He created everything and how you interpret it is a, a separate matter. But when it comes to verse 26, it says, Let us make men in our image according to our likeness. Here we see God, a hint of who God is. He uses a plural term, us, and not singular. And the New Testament, we realize it's because this is the Trinitarian God. And man is made in his image. Why? To rule over everything that God has created. And so when you look at Genesis 1, the climax is right here, when God makes man in His image. The only thing in creation that has God's image. And how we deal with this term, the Imago Dei, that man is made in the image of God. Now what is this image? Is it your DNA or chromosomes or mental capacities? Now does that mean that if you have lower mental capacities, or maybe you have a few more chromosomes like people with Down syndrome that they are not made in the image of God. No. So what's the image of God? If you look at this verse carefully, it suggests that God's image was upon men and women, Adam and Eve, who were a representation of all people. And so the Imago Dei is a reflection of God's attributes of goodness, of love, of justice. And men and women, the old and the young and people from different races coming together, we reflect more and more of this image of God. And so, C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Weight of Glory, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, civilizations, these are mortal. Their life is to ours as a life to a net. But it's immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, exploit. They're immortal horrors and everlasting splendors. Now, what is he saying? See, sometimes we look at people and we think, ah, these are ordinary people, you know, but when we see sports stars or actors and actresses or successful businessmen, we accord to them honour. But yet... You know, if we believe that everyone is made in the image of God, then everyone is unique and has a purpose. That our inherent value and dignity doesn't come because we are able to contribute something to the society, but because we are made in the image of God. And hence, the people you meet in your everyday life, the important ones, who are they? Now, with this COVID-19 shutdown, you know, we only have essential services left. Many of us find that we are not essential. Who are the essential people? They are the people that we usually do not pay attention to, right? The drivers, the people who stock our shelves. But everyone is accorded the same honour because we are made in the image of God. And conversely, those people that we honour, the stars, the entertainers, I mean, in such times, we realise that they are no different from every one of us. And so friends, when we talk about this concept of the Imago Dei, we must realize that of all of God's creation, only man is made in the image of God. And hence, life is precious. Now, so how does this, you know, when we, how is it relevant to this topic at hand on abortion? Whether we choose between life or choice. See, in this year's Golden Globe Awards, the best actress, the one who won the award, Michelle Williams, she took the platform to essentially say that, you know, she was able to have such achievements because of an abortion she had years ago. And so this was the statement she made when she received the award. She says, I'm grateful for the acknowledgement of the choices I've made and to have lived at a moment of society where choice exists because as women, as girls, things can happen to our bodies that are not our choice. Now, you know, when you listen to her, it sounds perfectly reasonable. We live in, she didn't even bring up the word abortion. It's just that we have a choice. If you have a choice, you want to keep your child, it's your choice. I don't want, it's my choice. But let's pull back the veil. And what is this argument about? What is the statement about? Essentially, she's saying because she was able to abort a child, she could pour her life into acting and hence get this award. So the question is, how did she view her, her child? As an obstacle as an impediment 
to a choice. But really, what's, what choice is she making? A choice for comfort, a choice for self actualization, a choice for herself. And so, when we deal with this issue of abortion, friends, it's not a straightforward answer. Everyone's situation is unique. But we examine a few questions regarding the topic of abortion. Firstly, we talk about the fetus. You know, is it a life? And this isn't a medical question, okay? Because doctors will tell you, as long as it's a heartbeat, it is life. And so, you know, in the stomach, it's life. There's no question about it. But people wrestle with this issue because it's more of a philosophical question or maybe even an emotional one. They know it's life, but really, it comes, there are two lives now, the mother and the child, and so the mother's life takes priority. Does it not? Now, in 1999, there was an unborn child named Samuel Arnes. He had some problems. It was discovered that he had spina bifida. And so the surgeon decided to operate on him while he was still in his mother's womb. There was a photojournalist called Clement on hand to take the picture. Basically, he explained, he said, towards the end of the surgery, as the surgeon was sewing up the womb, suddenly there was an arm thrust out of the womb and got hold of the surgeon's fingers and began squeezing them. And the surgeon tucked at it to test the strength. And the arm just held on. And so Clement said, I took that picture. Now, I want to show you that picture, but it's a bit bloody. So because of the kids around the TV, I decided not to. But you know, that picture was actually published in Times Magazine in 1999. And it captured the attention of the whole world because you can imagine a little arm coming out of the womb. But you know what impact that picture had on Clement himself? Basically, he said, you know, for the next two hours after the surgery, I sat there in shock. Prior to this, I was staunchly pro-choice for abortion. But now I see that it is a life. And it's wrong to just cut them up and remove their body parts and vacuum the rest up, which is what abortion really is. So friends, when we talk about this topic of abortion, life and choice, whose choice are we talking about? And so the first question we ask, is the fetus a life? And we know it is. When you look at it, there's no denying it. Now secondly, another argument that we use is often, what is the utility? What is the use of this child, you know? If it's severely handicapped, if it's born and it brings more difficulty to the family, it's little value and hence, we should not have the child. Is that how we view things? If we value someone based on their utility, on their usefulness to the society, what kind of world do we live in? And, and if you think about the 61 million abortions that happens around the world every year, only a minority deals with abortion of children that that, you know, that have severe issues. Most of the other abortions, they are healthy, normal children. And what is it that we lose? Can you imagine 60 over million lives a year? What potential have we lost because of abortion? Now, let me ask you some question, okay? If there's this family, a preacher with 13 kids, and they come to the number 14th child, now, will you keep that child? Or, the second case, the father of syphilis, the mother has four kids, she has TB. The first kid is blind, the second and third child is deaf, and the fourth child has TB too. And then she's pregnant with the fifth. Should she keep the child? The third case, a teenage girl got pregnant, and the fiancé is not the father of a baby. Would you advise her to keep the child? No. No, probably not, right? But you know, if we had asked that first lady with 13 children to abort the 14th child, then we have gotten rid of John Wesley, who is the founder of the Methodist movement. In fact, the 15th child, his brother, Charles Wesley, became a famous hymn writer, you know? And many of the hymns that we sing today were written by him. Now, if we had advised abortion for the second case, you know, the blind and child with two deaf kids and the fourth have TB, the fifth child was also deaf, but 
it was Beethoven. And have we aborted the child? I mean, can you imagine what lost we suffer? And the third is my favourite. You know, the young girl whose child, uh, the father of the child is not her fiancé. If we have gotten rid of the child, we have, would have gotten rid of the saviour of this world, Jesus Christ. And how about this lady, you know? Maria Dolos dos Santos Aveiro. She was a teenager when she got pregnant and she wanted to abort her child. But her faith informed her differently. And so eventually she kept her son. And now her son grows up and every day he would make fun of his mother and says that it's a good thing you didn't abort me. And you know, who, you know who, who the son is? Cristiano Ronaldo, the world-famous footballer. Now I put him last not because he's more important than Jesus. I wanted to put Jesus last, you know, but if I put... Mary of Nazareth. I mean, all of you will know who the child is, right? Yeah, so the point here is this. If we were to advise abortion because of the utility of a child, we say that it doesn't contribute much, so let's get rid of it. But you imagine a majority of the abortions are deal with children that we do not know what potential they have. And these would be the potential that we would have lost. And so, friends, when we look at this question from a philosophical... philosophical <laughs> philosophical point of view. The fetus is alive. From a pragmatic point of view, there's infinite potential in every child in the womb. And finally, we talk about preference. If we value a person based on their contribution to a society, then we have become a society of preferences. We, we value people based, based on their capacities. Can you imagine what such a world it's like. And we don't have to imagine too far because our world is a bit like that today. As I mentioned earlier, we give honour to people who are gifted, artists who are famous, you know, who have some value to us, people who, could, who start startups and become billionaires, we admire them. But the normal day-to-day -day people, we do not give a second thought to who they are and what value they add. Peter Singer, I've shared this before, who is the chairman of the ethics board in Princeton University, he once made this statement. He said, the life of a fetus is no greater value than the life of a non-human animal. At a similar level of rationality, self-consciousness, awareness, and capacity to feel. Basically, it means like a baby human and a baby animal, they are about the same. If we compare a severely defective human infant, what is handicapped? With a non-human animal, a dog, a pig, for example, we often find that the dog or pig has superior capacities for consciousness, for rationality. And then, as a result of that, when the death of the disabled infant will lead to the birth of another infant with better prospects of happy life, the total amount of happiness will be greater if the disabled infant is killed. Now, let's pause for a moment. I mean, this is a learned man. He hits the, the board of ethics in Princeton. And this is a statement he makes. That you know, what he's saying is that really, the child is disabled. And we get rid of that life. It gives a higher chance of happiness to the family, to have another child or the older siblings, to have a better quality of life. Then, it is justifiable to kill the child. Now, we think about these examples, Peter Singer, Michelle Williams, and we wonder, how is it possible that they can say things like that? But it's possible, friends. You say, how can the church survive in a culture like that? But the church has, and it will continue to. You see, in the Greco-Roman world, it was a society based on preferences and capacities. Aristotle himself said that certain races of ethnicities are incapable of higher rationality and so they deserve to be slaves. And because of this concept of capacities, you are valued because of what you can do. And In the Roman society, having abortion is legal. Infanticide, which means that they, they get rid of babies they don't want and most of the babies they throw out are girls, is legal and justifiable leaving the, the poor and the elderly who cannot protect themselves out in the streets to die was acceptable. Why? Because they believe 
that each one of us, we are valued based on what we can contribute to the family and to the society and to the country. And then along comes Christianity. That talks about the doctrine of the Imago Dei. And because of that, the church helped the poor, the women, the old, and put all the other cultures to shame. And we won over the Western culture. And today we live in a world that has been influenced by the Western world. We are, we are beneficiaries of a world that believes in compassion and love and mercy. But where did these concepts come from? They were built upon the Judeo-Christian faith. And today we want to remove the foundation. How long do you think these virtues would last? So friends, when we go back to this topic on life or choice, on abortion, talking about life of infant or the choice of the mother, we are prioritizing the mother's choice over the life. We do not refer to philosophy of pragmatism or preferences. We need to go back to theology. We need to return to theology. The Imago Dei, who is the one that reflects God's image the most? Colossians 1 says, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In John chapter 16, or 14, Jesus said to his disciples, who asked him, can we see the Father? He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus, when we talk about man being made in the image of God, who reflects God's image to the best? Jesus. And how do we then, you know, wrestle with this topic? It's something intellectual. We think about this topic of the image of God. How does it transform our lives? There's a little text in 2 Corinthians that says this, But we all, with veiled, unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And this verse is talking about, just before this, is dealing with the people reading the Word of God. And he says here, when we read it now as Christians, it's like unveiling our faces. The more we look at Jesus, the more we are transformed to be like Him, the more we are able to love people. And so sometimes, you know, we love our pets more than our irritating neighbour or their auntie down at a coffee shop. And you say, how do I love these people, right? Scripture tells us the more we look into the Word and see Christ, understand His love for us, the more we are transformed into His image and hence able to love others. You know, I do not know where we are today. Each one of us, what we struggle with. And when it comes to this topic of abortion, maybe you know someone who is struggling with this issue. A niece, a friend, a colleague. And while it is not an easy answer to give, every situation is different. But yet, friends, we must know that the child in the womb is a life. A life of infinite worth. Some of us, you know, we perhaps have been through an abortion and we deal with the guilt and sorrow. But you know, in the gospel, in Christ, there's no more condemnation. Whatever you've done, in Christ has been forgiven. And we no longer need to bear the guilt ourselves. There was this Vietnamese Christian who was so convicted about the issue of abortion that he bought a piece of land and began to bury all the bodies of the babies who were aborted. And he said after that, you know, women in his village started to come to the graveyard to pray and to cry, even though their own babies were not buried in the cemetery. And he asked them why. And many of them said that they had an abortion years ago. They were told it's all right, it's just a piece of cell. It's not a life. But after the abortion, they carried the guilt and shame with them all their lives. And coming to this cemetery to grief was an oppor opportunity for them to recognize this fact. And so, in the gospel, because of what Christ has done for us, for the forgiveness of sins, it's not just one sin, but all our sins, 
we no longer need to carry this guilt and condemnation. And maybe some of us want to do something about this topic of abortion or want to know about it. It's a website done up called heartbeatproject.sg There are stories of people who went through this journey. The stories of Vanessa, of Alice, of Kelly that I shared in the beginning. What are stories um, and testimonies of people who went through this struggle, but all the three stories, eventually, they kept their child. They wrestled through issues, faced challenges. But you know, at the end of the day, because we know that this is a choice that pleases God, no matter what obstacle we face, we have the peace and joy that comes from following the will of God. There was this doctor, Dr. Jeffrey, or uh, Dr. Chu, Peter Chu. In the 70s, he was teaching in the medical faculty in the University of Singapore. You know, he was a Catholic, but he had always skirted around the issue of abortion because his area of specialty was fertility. But that all changed in the late 70s when he started his own private clinic. He decided that since he was going to be a gynecologist, he should offer the full range of services to the women, including abortion. But later, he will admit that it is because of greed that he did this. Because, you know, abortion just takes a few minutes and he earns hundreds of dollars. He said, during that time, there was a huge conflict in my heart. Because on the one hand, I'll be pulling out life from a womb. On the other hand, I'll be pulling out body parts from limbs and legs and intestines. And sometimes the fetus will still be wriggling. I'll just leave it on the desk for it to die. And some of my nurses were really upset with me. But over the years, my business thrived. But because of this issue, my heart became dull towards God and I turned from Him. Until one day, I received a phone call from my friend and he confronted me on this issue. And after the phone call, I wept for hours. I told my wife to cancel all the appointments the next day and I spent the day praying. And then I heard God say, Peter, you have done many sinful things. And I broke down and repented before the Lord. But you know, friends, because of this divine encounter with God, Dr. Chu, his life and focus changed. In 2002, he started an organization in Singapore called A Life to counsel women who are thinking about abortion. And to date, they have counseled more than 10,000 women, and over 2,000 of them changed their minds. And he shared in his video testimony that one of the memorable patients he had had problems conceiving. She lived in JB and came to see him. Eventually, she got pregnant. But when she was 22 weeks pregnant, suddenly she called the doctor and said, you know, my amniotic sac has burst. And the local hospital said that it was threatening my life. And so they advised abortion. They gave me the drugs for abortion. But for two hours, you know, the baby's heart is still beating. What should I do? And so the doctor asked her to come over. He examined her. And for the next 10 weeks, you know, he took care of this patient. And finally, on the 32nd week, he delivered a healthy baby. And every year when this woman comes back for follow-up, he'll, she will bring her daughter, who is now 10 years old, and she'll point to the doctor and say, this is the life that you save, the one that you save. But Dr. Chu would say, it's not me, but God saved you know, kids, you've been patient with me sitting around the TV and you're thinking that, what is this Imago Dei about? But let me tell you, some of you sitting around the, your families are thinking, why don't your parents understand you? Maybe they don't love me. You know, why is, is his life always so difficult? Why is it that, you know, I go to school and there's a lot of pressure? And my parents want me to be extraordinary. My friends just want me to be ordinary. But you know, Every child is precious to their parents. I struggled with infertility myself, and so when we had children, I understand how precious they are. But more so, it's not your, only your parents think you're precious, but God thinks you're precious. And because you're made in the image of God, you have a unique purpose. At your age, you may be wondering, why am I here? 
I'm just so ordinary like all my friends. I'm no different. I'm not special. And it may be true. You know, we don't do perform very well in sports or in our studies. But you are special because you're made in the image of God. And God has a purpose for you. Especially for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. You are now a child of God, precious and treasured by God. How do you know? Well, look at the cross. God loves you so much that He sacrificed His only Son. And you tell me you're not special. Maybe now you're, you don't know your purpose. But as you follow the Lord, you love Him and understand His love for you. I promise you that one day, you'll find out that purpose and you'll understand your meaning of life and you'll see how precious you are in the sight of God. And so friends, today as we come to a close from Genesis chapter 1, the theology of the Imago Day, I want to urge all of us to choose the Imago Day, choose to honour people, to treat life as sacred, choose to pay respect to the people that pass you by, the person that cleans up your estate, who serves you coffee in a hawker centre, people that we don't pay attention to, and only now in such situations that we realise all these ordinary people are so important. But yet, there are no ordinary people in this world because every one of us are made in the image of God. Let us pray. Father, I give thanks to you. Once again, as you open your word, we are once again reminded of your gospel that Jesus Christ, you would come to sacrifice your life for us. That while each one of us are made in your image, it was marred by sin. And so, Lord Jesus, you came to restore the image, that dignity, that value to each one of us. And while we may think theology is, is dry and irrelevant, but yet, Lord, we, we don't realize how much it affects our daily lives. And I pray for each one of us here gathered to get here today. Lord, that we learn to see ourselves from your point of view, how precious we are because we are made in your image. Thank you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord.
remain standing and let us pray together. Father, we want to thank you that we are here because of the choices that our parents made when they chose life. Lord, we pray that you help us also to choose life. Help us in our daily decisions that we will choose things that honour you and glorify you. And help us Help us to be able also to teach that to our future generations. Lord, we see a new generation arising. This is the generation that has to go through COVID-19. And we pray, we pray that our faith in you might surpass that, our fears of COVID-19. We thank you. Receive God's blessing. Now all glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within us, accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Spend some time in silent meditation. And after that, you may discuss and share uh, what you have learned from the sermon or through worship today. If you are alone at home, you might want to WhatsApp call or Zoom somebody so that you can share with that person. God bless you. May the Lord bless and keep you this coming week.